We're going to look this morning at verses 6 through 10, although verses 9 and 10 could also be included with the, the second part. So we're going to look at verses 6 through 10. And I'm going to begin this section, which is actually right through to verse 19, if you wanted to follow every detail, <coughs> under the title of Jesus' Prayer for His Own. Jesus' Prayer for His Own. It's quite common to hear people say, I'll pray for you. And sometimes I fear we use it just because we don't know what else to say. We're faced with an impossible situation and we, we think, what can we say? Well, I'll pray for you. And, and what I'm left asking myself is, how often do I actually do it? How often do I carry on with that commitment and promise? Thankfully, the Lord reminds me often enough to pray consistently for his people and for our circumstances. The trouble is, in our prayer, we lack power, we lack the ability to keep going, we lack the insight to understand all aspects. But here's one before us who reveals himself as the God who prays for his people and is praying for his people even at this very moment of time. Again, people will often say, I believe in the power of prayer. And whenever I hear that, I cringe. This might shock you, but I don't believe in the power of prayer. I believe in the power of God, who has appointed prayer as the means by which we um, are able to access that power. And we have here the Lord Jesus demonstrating to us the power of God in his prayer for his people. As I said, it's actually a long <coughs> section, and I'm only going to do verses 6 to 10 this morning, time permitting. And I want here to look at the very fact that the Lord Jesus unashamedly talks about a specific people as being his own and describes himself as praying deliberately and specifically for those that are called the elect elsewhere in the scripture. So I want to look at Jesus' prayer for his own as those who are chosen by the Father, as those who confess to knowing God in Christ, and as those who are committed to glorifying God. As those who are chosen by the Father, verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Let's dig into that verse just for a few moments this morning and see what we can actually learn from it about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This thing is sticking. That's different. That's it. As those who are chosen by God and given to Christ. It's important to notice that in the Bible we are continually pointed to the fact that God has a people. He has had a people down through the ages. In fact, if you read your Bible, before there were any ages, they were chosen in Christ, it tells us elsewhere, before the foundation of the world. And God's glory is seen in that he has chosen a people for his own name. In a world where mankind has turned its back on God, he did not turn his back on man, but actually had previously planned to bring about the redemption of a multitude which no man can number, which will sing his praises for all time and for all eternity. When we come to this doctrine of election, many people get prickly about the whole idea. What we have to remember, though, is that nobody deserves to go to heaven. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And with that statement, the living God, the only God, would be within his just and righteous ways to stand back and say, on you go. But out of his mercy, out of his long-suffering, out of his kindness, anticipating the fall of man, he also planned that there should be a redeemer, and that through that redeemer, a multitude, as I've said, would be brought to faith and established in his righteous kingdom. They would be his people. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. 
you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. So we're looking here at an insight into how Jesus sees the 11 disciples at this point and the few others who are with them. We are given an insight here into how the Lord Jesus sees his people in all the ages. Before the chapter is finished, he'll move from just the 11 to to every Christian who will ever appear down through history. Those who are going to believe on me through their word. So we are given here to understand that he has a people whom God gave him out of the world. Run your eye down to verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For back in verse 2, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. This is a theme that you can't escape from when you read the Bible. However you want to work it out, it's there in ink on the page, often in black, sometimes in red. So it's a doctrine that you need to to acknowledge exists and then work at understanding me. Back in John chapter 6, When the Lord has just fed the thousands and many have turned away, he makes this statement, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. He's working on earth with a deliberate purpose and anticipates actually seeing and understanding that these people will be saved. I'm just having a slight technical problem this morning. It's refusing to scroll whom you gave me out of the world. My Father who has given to me is greater than than all, he says in John chapter 10, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. It's an awesome doctrine that God has a chosen people and that he has the right to choose and that nobody can complain if they are not amongst that multitude. It's a doctrine which Christians have wrestled to understand down through the ages. And back in the 17th century, there was an assembly, or there was a document printed from an assembly called the Canons of Dort, and it, it gives a very succinct explanation of election. It says in that document, Now election is the immutable purpose of God, whereby before the foundations of the world were laid, He has, according to the most free good pleasure of his own will, of mere grace, chosen out of the whole human race, fallen by its own fault from its primeval integrity into sin and destruction, a certain number of persons, neither better nor more deserving than others, but with them involved in a common misery unto salvation in Christ." whom even from eternity he has appointed mediator and head of the elect and the foundation of salvation. And therefore he has decreed to give them unto him to be saved. If you want a copy of it, I'll be quite happy to send it to you later. It's a lot to take in, isn't it? But it is a great truth and a great comfort to us when we understand this truth that God himself is working his purposes out in time for eternity. Some Christians disagree. Some Christian denominations are quite distinctly against this idea that God has an elect people chosen and set apart in Christ for whom Christ died and by whom Christ will redeem a people for his name and for his glory. Mr. Spurgeon came across some of them when he was preaching, we are told in one of his books, when he was preaching to a congregation of Methodists, it says in the book, or in Mr. Spurgeon's own words, the brethren were all alive, giving all kinds of answers to my sermon, nodding their heads and crying, Amen, Hallelujah, Glory be to God, he says, my spirit was stirred, and I preached away with an unusual (coughs) force and vigor. And the more I preached, the more they cried, Amen, Hallelujah, Glory be to God. At last, a part of text led me to what is styled high doctrine. So I said, this brings me to the doctrine of election. (coughs) He writes, there was a deep drawing of breath. Now, my friends, you do believe it. 
They seem to say, no, we don't. But you do, and I will make you sing hallelujah over it. I will so preach it to you that you will acknowledge it and believe it. So I put it thus. Is there no difference between you and other men? Yes, yes, glory be to God, was the answer. There is a difference between what you were and what you are now. Oh, yes, yes, they said. There is sitting by your side a man who has been to the same chapel as you have, heard the same gospel. He is unconverted and you you are converted. Who has made the difference? Yourself or God? The Lord, they said. The Lord, glory, hallelujah, yes, cried I. And that is the doctrine of election. That is all I contend for. That if there be a difference, the Lord made the difference. If there be a difference, the Lord made a difference. And he made that difference through his dear son. He came here, as he says in verse 6, and manifested your name. Other versions have revealed your name. He uncovered your name. He opened up the curtains and let your name, and in the Bible, name is never just a person's title. It's always his character, his power, and all that he is, does, and ever will be. So when he says he's manifested the the Lord God's name, it means that he has shown to these men who are with him great things about God. Remember the miracles. Remember the healings. Remember the teaching into the great crowds. All of these things have finally convinced the disciples that Jesus is the Christ appointed by God for their salvation and bringing it to pass in due time. I have manifested your name. And the effect of Jesus Christ manifesting (laughs) God's name to people is that they become believers. Back in the Psalms it writes, your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. That's always a helpful Psalm, Psalm 110 verse 3. People are not willing to come to Christ until God in Christ manifests his name. He does it now by the word and by the spirit, changing us on the inside so that what happens is we are moved to want to be saved. And in that way, changed and distinct from all the world. Ask anybody whether they became a Christian against their will. And everybody will tell you no. They were quite willing to become a Christian. In fact, they wouldn't have had it any other way. They were not bound up in chains. They were not beaten with sticks. They came, they read, they saw, and different to other people, they understood because Jesus had manifest his name, his Father's name to us. And so the doctrine of election became a reality. We were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. But we become who we are at that moment in time when we see Jesus and we would follow him. It's how God's elect are identified. People again get into all sorts of trouble trying to work out who the elect are. Some want to go around and work out whether you've got a letter E stamped on your forehead or not. It's nonsense. Some say you've got to have some strange inner feeling before you know whether you're elect or not. But in actual fact, the Bible is very clear that the the mark of a person who is amongst these that Jesus is praying for, the mark of that kind of person is that they come to faith. John 6, 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father, notice, but it doesn't stop there, comes to me. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. John 6, 67, then the, the, Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Notice those two words, to believe and And no, earlier on in this chapter, I preached it a couple of weeks ago. This is eternal life, verse 3, that they may know you. It's not simply an intellectual decision which a neutral mind will choose if it's given enough information. 
It's a miracle of grace whereby a man or woman is wakened from a state of being dead in trespasses and sins, made alive unto God, and now reaches out and grasps the gospel. He has a people. And those people are identified by the fact that they not only hear, they obey. He who has my commandments, John 14, 21, and keeps them, it is he who loves the Father. It is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Oh, dear friends, we need to understand that God has a people, and that that people have been given to Christ. Christ died, bore their sin, and because he bore their sin, he sent forth the Spirit into the world, and now the Spirit and the Word, uh, through the, the voice of the page or the voice of the preacher, calls men and women to faith, so that we can know who these chosen people are. They hear the call and they respond. That's how you identify who the elect are. They have an active faith in God. You've learned of God's holiness. You've learned that you're a sinner. But you've also learned that God has provided a saviour and command you to come to believe and to delight. And today what's happened is you're found resting in the Lord Jesus Christ. You may not be able to explain what's called high doctrine, but you know this for sure, that he's my saviour. I'm trusting him. I'm believing what he has accomplished. And that's why Christians need to hear the gospel over and over and over and over. Because it brings us back to this great truth that we are not saved by our own performance. We are saved by grace, through faith. And that, not of yourself. Where did it come from? I hope you can complete the verse, Ephesians 2.8. It is the gift of God. Salvation is a mighty miracle. And dear friend, if you know that kind of salvation, then that's the key to joy. Whatever else might be going on in your life, that's the key to joy. Somebody asked me recently, what's the difference between happiness and joy? Happiness depends on what's happening. And so you can go up and down in that scale. Joy, dear friend, is Jesus and you, somebody says, with nothing in between. Nothing in between. He loved me. He gave himself for me. It's no wonder that Wesley wrote after he was converted, didn't he? And can it be that I should gain an interest? My chains fell off, he says. My heart was free. I rose, went forth. Notice again the next line. And followed thee. That's the mark of a believer. That's the mark of a, a, an elect child of God. They hear, they respond, and they go. Now, when you meet people who are still resisting God's call to salvation, you need to tell them that they are in a most dangerous position. It's true there might be a day in the future when they're converted, but if they continue in their present state, they would seem to indicate that they are not among the elect, and therefore we need to warn them to flee from the wrath to come. Mrs. Thatcher was famous, wasn't she? She was a lady who was not for turning. But that's an incredible picture of so many unbelievers today, isn't it? Not for turning. And they imagine that they've picked up from our world reasons to stay in their unbelief. Well, dear friend, I want you to understand that we have a task to tell them they're in a place of great danger from which they will ultimately enter into eternal destruction. <coughs> God has a people. God has given them to Christ. God has made provision for, through Christ for his truth to be manifest to them. And they go on knowing God. That's where I want to go to next with verses 7 and 8. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Really, this is an expansion of the last phrase in verse 6. 
that I do believe it's important enough to drive home by grace so that we might be very, very clear. The mark of a true Christian, dear friend, is not only that they know Jesus died for sinners, they are persuaded Jesus died for me and they want to live for his glory. Because God's glory is seen when those for whom Christ died, his elect, come to faith and they live out the faith in the world that they're in. <coughs> Sorry, it's just stuck again. And they live out their faith in the world that they're in. Their profession shows that they are believers. And as saving faith has taken root in their life, they hear his voice. John 10 verse 27. He knows them and they follow him. Consider then for a moment, dear friend, why it is that you want to be in church on a Sunday morning. As I was trying to explain to the children why Eric Liddell would refuse to run on a Sunday. He would rather honour God on that day. Why is it that a child of God does such a thing? It's because this grace has come into our life. John's Gospel makes it very clear that this is the, the, the very distinctive mark of Christianity. We choose to follow Jesus Christ. Our following is far from perfect. We are prone to wander, as the hymn writer says, or another says. Often we stumble. But the fact is, if you look at the course of a believer's life, they're following. They might well go into Bypath Meadow as... Uh, Bunyan writes in Pilgrim's Progress and suffer terrible times there but ultimately they're on this path of life leading to heaven and in that they're distinct from the rest of the world right back at the beginning of John's Gospel in chapter 1 there's a couple of verses which are well worth highlighting and noting to see this distinction between believers and unbelievers John chapter 1 and verse 10 speaks about Jesus he was in the world and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. And the world did not know him. Always look at that word know as being more than just intellectual um, recognition. In the scripture, especially in John, know describes an intimate personal relationship. He came to his own, that's the Jews, and his own did not receive him. <clears throat> But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. Notice the last three words, but of God. A Christian is a man or a woman who has been born of God. You must be born again, the Lord told Nicodemus. And he repeated himself, Unless you're born again, you cannot see and you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. But those who are born again know the power of the Spirit in their life. They know the wonder of God's work, at word at work in us, leading us onwards in perfect confidence with Christ. Because Jesus' words to us are in fact a delight. Back in chapter 7 and verse 16, he says, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it's from God or whether it's on my own authority. He shall know. The more we follow Christ, the sweeter it becomes, the clearer the path gets. And if you're not seeing a clear path, it's because something's got in the way of you following. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me. Again, that parallels with this manifesting your name. I have given them the words, the whole message. Modern so-called Christians want to talk just about God's love. And I think we need to talk about God's love. But they leave out God's righteousness, God's holiness, and God's justice. And so they create a caricature of Christianity. As you come to the scripture, you need to understand God's love is part of his being. And it's the, the, the source of sending his son. God so loved the world. 
But he so loved the world and sent his son because men were perishing apart from the son. And that message then that Jesus brings, that message that Jesus is, is the source of eternal life. That's how the Lord describes the change that takes place, the change that marks a believer. They have a life which has begun on earth and will go on throughout eternity. As disciples, they are now committed to following the Lord Jesus Christ. They want to be where he is. They have believed that God sent him. And that's an important statement in this verse. Remember, in the upper room, the disciples were struggling with the whole idea of why Jesus was going to Calvary. Here they are on the path toward the Garden of Gethsemane just before he's arrested. And it would appear as he prays for them, he understands that they, 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 they've comprehended that this is part of God's necessary plan. That he is the Christ that's come into the world. But he's also the Christ who is going to the cross they have believed that you sent me. That little phrase occurs five times in this single chapter. He's the one who's come into the world with a mission and a purpose. Verse 8, verse 18, verse 21, verse 23, and verse 25. He's the promised Messiah, but he's not come to set up an earthly kingdom. He's come to go to the cross at Calvary, to die there in the place of all who believe in him to rise again on the third day, to ascend to the Father's right hand where he ever lives to make intercession for us. We live in a day and an age when people are constantly asking us for some form of identification. It used to just be an American thing, but even in this country now, people go about with badges hanging on, don't they? We want to know who you are before we tell you anything. Well, it's like that with the Lord Jesus, except it's not a badge, it's a book. Here is his identification. If you're a Christian, you've seen that identification. And you see here the Savior whom God has sent into the world with a specific purpose. The early church clearly understood it. That Jesus was the one God sent. And that he was sent on a mission with a purpose to call out a people for himself by dying in their place. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, holy brethren... Partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our faith, Christ Jesus. Look at Jesus. You're the He is the one who will guide us through this world and this life. And He is the one that Christians now see and believe and are committed to following. Martin Luther was asked what makes the difference between God's words and the words of a man and he answered like this a man's word is a little sound that flies in the air and soon vanishes but the word of God is greater than heaven and earth yea greater than death and hell for it forms part of the power of God and endures everlastingly when that words verse 8 which Jesus gives to us takes place in our life there is a power conversion takes place a new perspective a new confidence is given to us so as believers we are now committed to following Jesus because we've come to know God's love for us we've come to understand his grace towards us and we're going to follow him all the way to glory God's election remember is made visible in believing people that's why it's so important for us as Christians to live to honor God How will the world ever know that there is an elect people? Because they will have heard of God's holiness and they will know the call to be holy because he is holy. They will understand that Christ having died for our sins, our lives are now to be lived for his glory. We're not here to please ourselves. We're here to follow Jesus and to follow him all the way home. Now this is very important for us as Christians because it's this desire to follow God which is a central part to our assurance. And when the non-believer wants to have some kind of assurance before he believes, we need to tell them, I'm afraid, you need to believe before you can have assurance. There will always be another question that you want answered, another idea that you need sorted out. 
You weigh the evidence here and there. But in actual fact, you only understand this evidence by actually accepting it for yourself. I read a story about a little boy who had been sent. It must have been a few years ago to the store and he was coming home with a <coughs> pail of honey in his hand, it said in the book I read. A man who was walking beside him watched him and the little boy slipped his finger into the honey and then because he had been taught not to wipe such sticky things on his clothes he stuck his finger in his mouth and having tasted the honey the smile came on his face the man watched the boy doing that several times so he said to him what have you got in that pail lad he said some honey sir is it sweet the man asked yes sir how sweet is your honey it's very sweet well I don't understand you says the man I asked you how sweet the honey is, honey is and you have not yet told me how sweet it is why it's very sweet the butler lad said well you're a funny little fellow he said back to him I asked you how sweet your honey is and you just tell me it's very very sweet now can't you tell me really how sweet your honey is so the boy stopped, stuck his finger in the honey and said, lick it. Try it for yourself. There are some things in life you can only know as real by taking it and testing it and trying it for yourself. And so, dear Christian, remember the day when God gave you that grace to do so. Remember what it tasted like to have everlasting life. If I continue the metaphor to know that your sins were covered, to know that your hope was established, to know that you and Jesus Christ were now united by grace forever. And if you're not a Christian, we can only tell you it's very, very, very sweet. But here it is. Take it for yourself. These people have been given to Christ. He's come to die for them. Verse 9, he says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world but for those you have given me, for they are yours. I pray for them. This really is the icing on the cake in this passage. It's a fabulous thing that the Lord has manifested his name to us, <laughs> Father's name to us, that we've been given the grace to believe in it, and that we now have salvation. But this whole chapter, and especially this verse, drive home to us the, the continuous work of our Lord Jesus. Some people ask, don't they, what is Jesus doing now? I mean, he's been here, he's died for us, he's risen again, what's he doing now? Is he out playing golf? Of course not. The Bible makes very clear that Lord Jesus was praying for his people while on earth. Remember, Peter was warned that he was going to fall but was encouraged. Behold, I praying for you. Here the whole group of disciples are being prayed for. And as I said, before the chapter ends, you'll see that he was even praying for you before you sat in your chair this morning. And that is his constant work in glory. Because he's committed, dear friends, to revealing God's glory to the world by revealing God's glory in you and me. And God's glory is no more clearly seen than in his great work of election. That he should take a sinner like you or me. And that he should rescue us from eternal damnation. And make us a child of God and give us a crown to wear and a, a glorious future. All of that, dear friend, is designed so that God might be glorified. We are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, Paul says in Ephesians. We are his works of art, is how that word can be translated. I think it's Ephesians 2 and verse 10. What do people do with the work of art? They stand back and they go, it's beautiful. The artist must be a great artist. And so as you and I live in this world, men and women are meant to stand back and say, wow, it's beautiful. You, you may or may not be, but what God has done in you is and then they should stand back and say, God is incredible. That was how the world was created, wasn't it? As Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, that was the purpose of their being there, to worship God, to, to, to reveal his glory and splendor by living in communion with him. Here the Lord of glory reveals that even when he's facing the trauma of Calvary, 
is focused on the salvation of his people of bringing them through it again the whole chapter helps us see that of bringing them through it and then from there taking that message out into the world so that millions have now come to faith in Jesus Christ think about it let it sink in what is Jesus great work which runs parallel to his work on Calvary it's to be a mediator and an intercessor ever living to make intercession for us in the next few weeks we'll look at the following verses but you'll see in verse 11 he's praying that we might be united together in verse 15 he's praying that we might be kept safe from Satan and in verse 17 he's praying that we might become holy or be sanctified through the truth those are maybe three separate sermons in the next few weeks God willing but he's working with us he's working for us that we will indeed come to glory in due course and the New Testament writers found this to be a great thrill Romans 8 34 who is he who condemns it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Hebrews 7.25, therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession <coughs> for them. And then in chapter 9 verse 24, Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself. And then it goes on, and now to appear in the presence of God for us. The Savior died for us. The Savior rose for us. The Savior lives for us. In distinction to the world around us. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. You need to be just careful here because there are times when he does pray for the world. When he's on the cross he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. But in the context of the passage here, there's a special and particular prayer for the people of God, for the children of God. He's praying that we will be brought through all that lies before us. He's praying that we will be brought to all that God has prepared for us. He is, remember, the good shepherd. The good shepherd who will give his life for the sheep. And as a good shepherd, he will bring us safe to glory. He's committed, you see, to that great work. And that great work is his daily and constant business. At this very minute, dear Christian, Jesus is praying for you. There might be things in your life which are destructive if they're continued and he's praying that you might understand more of the incredible nature of his sacrifice that you might understand more of the wonder of his love he sent his spirit into the world to teach us he's given us his word to enlighten us and he's praying that you will be brought into conformity to this world and that satan will not have the upper hand and he's applying his merits to your life and to mine That's the old country western hymn. The chimes of time ring out the news don't they, that someone slipped and fell. And the fact is, in any one week, we all slip and fall, don't we? Where do we get the grace to go on? There's a saviour at the Father's right hand who looks upon us with grace and favour because he loved us and gave himself for us let this sink into your mind because when you understand in the midst of your weakness that he is so committed to you you become unstoppable that's how the church grew from a tiny huddle in an upper room to a worldwide entity that's where the great multitude comes from men and women believe it and they go forth in it but if you're not a christian i have to impress upon you if you're not with Christ you're on your own nay worse than that you're actually a slave of Satan if you're not a Christian you're left to struggle through life and will finally perish eternally it's only because Christ prays for us that we will indeed go forward and come to glory oh Christian friend be challenged afresh 
by Jesus. Prayer for us. Prayer for us as God's elect. Prayer for us as those that he's revealed his truth to. And give yourself afresh to live for his praise and for his glory. I'll pray for you. Well, I do pray for all my congregation. But I can't do for you what Jesus does. He's praying for you. And he will bring you to glory. Amen.